Condemned 2 is a game I remember incredibly fondly for never having played it. When I was young, my dad had a Game Informer subscription through GameStop. I vividly remember getting these magazines and leafing through the pages to try and find new games through the reviews section or just any new information I could get my hands on. It also acted as a nice form of window shopping as a kid. But the things that always stuck in my mind were the ads. If you weren't around for the time of physical gaming news, then you wouldn't be aware that these ads could get pretty crazy. Games like The Suffering would have these vivid, massive advertisements that were incredibly visceral for the time. But one that always stuck out in my mind was the cover of Condemned 2 Bloodshot. It was one of those games I always knew about because of the ads, but never got around to actually playing. It escaped me during my childhood and then into my adulthood. Over the years, the game has gained a very mixed reputation. Some think that it's a sequel that doesn't quite live up to the reputation of the first game, with an outlandish plot and some misguided characterizations. Others think that this game is an over-the-top risk, something that tries a lot of new things and steps out of the shadow of the first entry. After playing the game, I've ended up somewhere in between. The game certainly isn't perfect, but it definitely has a lot going for it. With a new fleshed out and intricate combat system, the fights and encounters feel satisfying and deep, but some of the new mechanics are a bit underutilized, introduced too late, or a bit janky. The story is incredibly over the top in some areas and just totally jumps the shark at a certain point, but it's one of those stories that doesn't really care about what you think. It's oozing with that late 2000s edge that is a huge guilty pleasure of mine. But overall, it's a really fun and enjoyable experience. So that's what I want to talk about today. We'll be taking a look at Condemned 2 Bloodshot, diving deep into gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous video on the first Condemned game, I would recommend checking that out now because it will provide a lot of context for the story moving forward. If you really don't want to watch that video, then don't worry because I'll give brief background information at relevant points. Spoilers for Condemned 2. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Condemned 2 Bloodshot. Development on Condemned 2 began only a few months after the first game had released. It was once again developed by Monolith Productions and published by Sega. The game was officially announced in July of 2007 and was shown off at E3 that same year. A month after announcement, violent games had come under fire from the ESRB. Manhunt 2 had been given an adult-only rating due to its graphic nature. Because of this, Monolith Productions got in contact with the ESRB and had to cut some scenes to avoid the same fate. They specifically had to tone down some of the more gory and violent environmental kills. On the performance side of things, Greg Grunberg, who voiced Ethan Thomas in the first game, chose not to reprise his role for the second entry. This was mostly due to the change in the character and the studio wanting a darker and edgier voice for Ethan. On that same note, Ethan Thomas was drastically changed for the Condemned sequel. He was made into a much darker, broodier, and troubled guy than we saw in the first game. Frank Rook, the lead designer and writer on the game, felt that the change was necessary. He thought it was a natural evolution between the first and the second entries. In the first game, Ethan was just discovering the dark world around him. In Condemned 2, he was a bit broken as a result. The whole team didn't agree with this change though. Some of the staff felt like Ethan was changed a little too much for their liking. The story for the game was constructed in an almost backwards manner. The game environments were designed first, and then the team figured out a way to weave them together. This led to more disagreements among the team, causing some to feel that the story and environments didn't have any cohesion. Jonathan Stein, the lead level designer, stated, Level theming was more centered around what environments would be new than concern over a cohesive whole. Some, myself included, were concerned that the environment, the story, and the enemies felt schizophrenic, or at least not cohesive. The team did ensure that the environments were detailed though, visiting many real-world locations like the Sunny Jim Peanut Butter Factory in Georgetown, Seattle, the Satsop Nuclear Power Plant in Washington, and the Timberline Lodge in Oregon. 
The team took influences from movies like Dark City and The Cell, as well as the Silent Hill games and the album Oceanic by Isis. This album fucking slaps, by the way. Frank Rook would state that the philosophy of the game in general was to add depth and variety to all facets of the game, and that the starting point of the sequel was finding everything the first game could have done better and doing it right this time. It seems like the team really wanted to improve this time around. They wanted to take in player feedback and make the necessary changes to make something that worked better and was more fun to play. Despite all of the troubles and worries with development, Condemned 2 Bloodshot was released on March 11th, 2008 for the Xbox 360 and March 18th, 2008 for the PlayStation 3. A quick note before we get into things. I just first want to note the version of the game that I played for this review. If you know anything about Condemned 2, then you'll know that the game is actually stuck in a forever hell on the Xbox 360 and the PS3. Jace Hall, the founder of Monolith Productions, is actually the sole owner of the IP at this point. For whatever reason, nothing has really been done with it though, and this game was never ported to PC. Naturally, this leads one down the road of emulation, but emulating this game on both RPCS3, the main PS3 emulator, and Xenia, the main Xbox 360 emulator, bears poor results. They both have tons of bugs, and as I'm sure there are ways around this, I just decided to buy a cheap copy on eBay and break out the old trusty PS3. The PS3 version of the game did have some frame rate issues at certain points, so it definitely wasn't perfect. When transitioning between areas or doing some complex animations, the game would often slow down considerably. I can't be sure how well the Xbox 360 version of the game plays because I didn't want to buy it just for a one-off line in this review. The game was still playable though and ran fine other than the small handful of issues. Our game actually begins with the mission Rock Bottom, a two-word explanation for where our main character, Ethan Thomas, has ended up. Before we join him, though, a group is reviewing an audio recording of someone being killed, and before they died, they mentioned Ethan by name. The group is the SCU, the Serial Crimes Unit from the first game. Director Ike Farrell is here, as well as Rosa, who assisted Ethan in his investigations throughout Condemned. She has quite a bit of a makeover at this point, though, to the point where you'd be forgiven if you didn't realize it was her. Agent Dorland is here as well, someone we'll become very familiar with over the course of the game. The recording was from a call that Rosa received this morning. Farrell wants to find Ethan, but after his suspension, he resigned from the agency and has been laying low. We then see Mr. Thomas, who's had quite the makeover since we last saw him. Ethan has let his hair and beard grow out, he looks disheveled, tired, and angry. He even has wraps around his hands, ready to fight at a moment's notice. At this point, Van Horn calls the bar and wants to talk to Ethan, but he denies the call. Ethan then begins hallucinating. His glass overflows with sludge, and a strange vampiric-looking creature bumps into him, which Ethan responds to by beating his face in. The bartender kicks him out, and he's left on the stairs. So before we get too deep into things here, I just want to talk about the surface-level, edgy changes that Condemned 2 has made. Drunk, tired, and pissed off. Why? Because this damn city's too fucking blind to see what's killing them. Clearly, the first game wasn't like this. It was a simple crime thriller about a detective searching for a meta serial killer, one that hunted down other killers. The game does veer into the paranormal a bit at the end, but it's a grounded tale for the most part. Now, Ethan is monologuing to himself in a brooding way, he's pissed off, he's beating people in bars, the soundtrack has even changed to a pseudo new metal style at certain points. It's very much a game of its time. This era, 2008, was full of this stuff. Every western game tried to take their own spin on it, to be hip, to be cool with the kids but that honestly doesn't feel like what Condemned is doing here. Condemned 2's expression of this badass aesthetic and the cool angry guys beating down their demons doesn't feel like a cash-in to try and capitalize on a trend. It feels like an aesthetic choice that the designers wanted to make, and honestly, it just kind of works. 
in any other sort of setting, this change would be like putting butter on strawberries. It just wouldn't go together. But here, it feels like it fits, especially with the new information that we'll get from the world and the turn that the story begins to take in the second half. The game just feels right. It does take some time to sink in though. You have to be along for the ride and right from the beginning, I didn't really want to get in the passenger seat. But throughout the course of my playthrough, I got more accustomed to it until I realized that I was just being a spoil sport and this whole thing was damned fun. Condemned 2 puts cool over almost everything else and I think that's pretty cool. A bum tries to help Ethan out of the cold as he's sitting in an alley. We can tell this guy to piss off by hitting a button prompt called respond. These little moments appear in each level and it basically functions as a fuck off button. A lot of the time it just causes Ethan to yell at whoever is talking to him. These are kind of important though because making sure that we hit all of them in any level will give us a better score when we complete it. We then follow the man into a cage where he tries to get us some booze, but we're attacked by the same vampiric looking man and his friends. This serves as our tutorial for the game, and there's probably no better time than now to talk about the combat. Condemned 2 has the same bones as the first game when it comes to fighting. The premise is still there, attacking enemies up close with melee weapons, getting in scrappy brawls with random enemies on the street, and just generally fighting for your life. All of that is still here, for the most part, but Condemned 2 changes and adds a lot. We can still pick up weapons from the ground or rip things off walls to bash our foes' heads in, but the variety and uniqueness of each item has been upgraded a ton. We'll use a ton of wacky killing instruments throughout the game, a lot of which are themed around the level that we're currently in. We can also use our fists this time around, which is helpful because weapons now have a durability and will break over time. The fists aren't that great though, and while they feel good to use, they just don't do much damage and there's not a lot of practicality to back up the impact that you feel in your hands. It feels good, but it doesn't amount to much. The other big addition to the combat system is combos. We can now pull off a specific set of moves in combat to complete a combo. Depending on which one we use, our damage will be multiplied to the enemy. The system can actually get pretty wild with some of the longer combos being pretty difficult to pull off. The reason they can prove challenging is because we can't get hit in the middle of our combo or we have to restart it. Avoiding damage in Condemned 2 is not easy either. We will get hit a lot. Just like the first game, enemies don't just stand there and get hit, they're gonna punch you back, and they're gonna do it when you're least expecting it. We'll have to learn and read enemy attacks and try to predict when a swing is coming our way. The blocking system has been improved as well, allowing us to fully block now without having to adhere to a small timing window like before. Our weapon will take damage when blocking though, unless we parry. If we time our block correctly, the opponent will be knocked back slightly and staggered, giving us a short amount of time to get some hits in. We can still kick, of course, but our kick also doesn't do very much damage and is mainly made for pushing enemies back rather than chunking down their health. Ethan also has a hook now, which requires us to press the left stick in before we punch. This can knock an enemy off balance and is part of a lot of the combos in the game. We can throw weapons now as well, which is a fantastic way to close the distance between you and an enemy. It's also just a great way to cap off a weapon that you know is about to break. We have a chain attack that can be used when its meter is full. This is basically a one attack kill that has us follow a few button prompts in slow-mo and sees Ethan decimating his opponents with his bare fists. We can also pull off finishers on enemies, just like in the first game, but now we can use the environment. We can pull an enemy to a part of the area that we're in and brutally end them in spectacular fashion. I thought these were pretty cool, but I never got to use them much during my playthrough and almost even forgot they existed. This is mostly because it's difficult to tell when an enemy is about to go into a finisher state or when they're getting back up. This led me to always just smacking them with my weapon when they were down, which will kill the enemy without you being allowed to do an environmental finisher. Guns are also back in a pretty big way. 
We'll use ranged weapons a lot more in this entry, though that mostly comes during the second half of the game. I do think the shooting is pretty awkward and condemned too. It just doesn't feel great at all, it's difficult to aim, and it's mostly due to the camera movement in the game. Our vision will just whip around so fast. There is a setting to adjust this, and I did lower it quite a bit, but it never seemed like it was fully there. The system does have a story feature though. The gun will constantly sway when we're aiming down our sights. This is because Ethan is a drunk and he can't control his shakes. We can drink alcohol in the game to stave off these shakes for a bit and give us a steady aiming capability, but it's only temporary. This clearly brings the character closer to the player. We have to suffer Ethan's problems as well. They aren't isolated to the game world. And paradoxically, we have to feed his addiction if we want to perform better. There are a ton of other aspects to combat, small upgrades that we'll receive at the end of each stage, but we'll talk about those as we come across them. Overall, I think the combat is probably the best part of Condemned 2. I can explain the systems all day, but what I can explain is just how fun and challenging it is to play, for the most part. Generally, it's incredibly satisfying to pull off a good combo. It feels great not to get hit, to push in, getting a few punches, maybe a hook and pull back, avoiding the attacks of the enemy. It feels even better to parry an attack and then punish the enemy for their mistake. The whole system is also very dynamic. We can throw weapons at enemies' legs to knock them down, we can shoot specific parts of the body and our enemies will react to that specifically. It's not the most advanced thing ever, but is still pretty impressive for a game of its time, especially one made in as short of a time window as Condemned 2. The system does take some getting used to, but once you get your bearings, you feel like you're really fighting on the street, scrapping in these dirty districts. If I had to point out one complaint about the combat overall, it would be that I don't think it has the same atmosphere as the first game. Condemned really made you feel like you were fighting for your life. People were attacking you that wanted to take your head off, and you had to stop that in any way that you could. Condemned 2 feels a bit more arcadey, and I think that's sort of the point. The whole game in general is much less of a horror than the first. It's this whole new weird thing that was trying to be the opposite of what Condemned was, but you definitely don't feel the fear and tension a lot of the time in battles. I can't say that it's completely gone, it does rear its head at a few different moments, but not nearly as much as the first game. After we defeat the goons in the cage and learn the ins and outs of the system, the monster attacks Ethan. As he's battered though, he wakes back up. Maybe it was all a hallucination. We then head through the next area and find a TV that we can interact with. These television sets and some radios are scattered throughout each level for us to seek out and find. We have to tune each one in to be able to see the picture, but they all have some sort of story to tell about the world. Some are just Ethan's demons speaking to him. Others are news broadcasts that expand the landscape and tell us just how shitty things really are out there. I do like this quite a bit, and it's one of many things that Condemn 2 does to make the game feel less isolated. The first was very focused on a small story, but this game makes the world feel more real. It feels like there are consequences for what is going on in the story. It feels like people are struggling, suffering because of what's happening. It adds stakes to the tale overall. This first message is from that monster, telling Ethan that he shouldn't have ignored the call from Van Horn. We need to find him, he's the last hope we have. And as we turn around, Van Horn spews some vile liquid in Ethan's face and disappears. We make our way through the next building to find a sonic emitter downstairs. These small wall gadgets are constantly pushing out sonic blasts. They apparently have an effect on the population, and we learn later that they're doing something to the birds as well. We can destroy these things, acting as a collectible for each level. Ethan chases Van Horn through the alleyways and eventually comes across a street filled with black ooze. Monsters begin sprouting from the ooze and we have to defeat them, otherwise they'll tear Ethan to shreds. These are one of the most annoying enemies in the game. Most of them only take one hit to kill, but certain ones will tear into us and they're pretty fast, so they're hard to hit. We find another TV where the monster explains the severity of our situation. We have to find Van Horn because he's the only one left that knows what's happening to Ethan. He was with Ethan during the last game. He knows what they're up against. 
We find him soon after being attacked by the black sludge creatures, and we eventually find him tied up in the sludge, but we're attacked by the monster before being able to get to him. Ethan wakes back up outside, back in the cage, as if none of that had ever happened. Rosa and Dorland arrive to confront the strange man, but he gets away. Ethan immediately recognizes the voice on the phone as Van Horn. Farrell wants Thomas brought in so that he can help them solve whatever's going on. As Ethan walks away, we see a massive presence is standing behind him. Something is waiting in his shadow. This is the end of the first mission, and at the end of each mission, we'll receive a rating based on how good we did. We can achieve bronze, silver, or gold. This rating is determined by how many sonic emitters we found, how many response button prompts we interacted with, news reports we found, and the optional objectives for each level. The higher the rating we receive, the better the upgrade for that mission will be. With the end of the first, we receive the Fist Weapon. This adds brass knuckles to our left hand and increases damage done with that side. Ethan is now on a mission. He's working with Agent Dorland and LaRue. Dorland tries to put Ethan in his place because these two are already butting heads. We have to make our way through an abandoned hotel at this point. Here we begin to find TVs that introduce us to a new broadcast, one led by Tony Rhodes called Streets. Tony will be personally investigating the city and telling us about the nitty, gritty, and dirty life that is lived out there. As we reach the elevators, Rosa gives us an update on the case. Because the recording had two gunshots in it, we're looking for two bodies, a police officer and Van Horn himself. During this conversation, we can ask different questions to try and get the best information out of Rosa. If we pick the right topics, then we'll get a better investigator rating at the end of our mission, once again, tying to our overall rating. This is one of the better changes that Condemned 2 makes. There are a ton of things that make you feel involved in the game. It feels like the project is constantly giving you things to do so that it won't lose your attention. This keeps players engaged and makes us feel like we aren't missing a beat. We always have to stay ready because something could be coming up. We're given a couple leads to go on. We need to find the body of the Metro Police Officer and Van Horn. When we come across the body, we get our first detective section. This is another area that Condemned 2 massively improves on. Instead of just washing our UV light over a couple of areas and sending the data off to Rosa, we now have to actually do some detective work. We have to find identification spots and pass information off to Rosa. Our job here is identifying the body and the wounds on it. This is so much better for the same reason that the dialogue choices are better, to keep us engaged and actually thinking about the process rather than just passively checking off notes on a box. The details we find here are actually noted in our brain, stored there because we were the ones that found them. Ethan quickly realizes that the body has been moved and we have to track the blood trail to find out where it came from. We eventually trace the trail all the way back to the scene of the crime and we find Van Horn's body nearby. He was killed in a ritualistic type of way. His body was spiked and his chest was opened up. Rosa overhears a conversation that Dorland is having. He's clearly up to something. While reviewing the data, she finds something interesting, but the group has been attacked trying to get the body out of the hotel. Ethan is separated from Dorland and LaRue, who already have the body in tow. We're forced to make our way through this filthy district, one that's currently on fire and hosts to many fist battles between the dregs of the streets. We end up seeing LaRue and Dorland heading to the way out, but LaRue purposefully ignores Ethan, leaving him behind. Ethan finds a man in one of the buildings that asks him if he makes that sound, if he's part of the Oro. We're then shown a cult logo, the symbol of the Oro. Ethan finally gets back into contact with Rosa, and he has questions. She doesn't know why Van Horn was so important. She can help him get out of this jam, though, and heads to his location to pick him up. At the end of this level, we gain the stun gun once again. This is actually very overpowered because using it basically gives us a free kill on most enemies. It also has a ton of shots, making it just way too strong. Luckily, I forgot that I even had it most of the time and didn't really end up using it for most of the game. The area of town that Ethan is in has been closed off from the rest of the city, so Rosa can't get in. 
He's going to have to meet up with her outside of the riot zone. LaRue reaches out to Ethan and he's pissed that he was left behind. LaRue says that Dorland gave him the order and that the whole thing is more complicated than Ethan realizes. Ethan ends up in an old doll factory making his way to Rosa. This is another thing that Condemned does incredibly well, it's stages. Each level, maybe outside of the first few, feels really unique. Every mission is its own set piece with standout moments and a theme that runs throughout. The Doll Factory is the first one of these that really sticks out in my mind. The whole level is littered with tiny exploding dolls and tons of creepy creatures. The whole thing just works really well, even if some of the enemies can be a bit annoying. We have to give LaRue some information about exactly where in the doll factory that we are so he can help us out. Once we do, we're set upon by a pack of exploding baby dolls. Deeper into the facility, we find a man trapped under some falling debris. The factory itself is on fire and collapsing. We have to get a gas mask to be able to brave the smoke and save him. After this, we're given our first boss battle, the Doll Woman. This is a very lanky, tall doll lady that wields a lollipop-shaped saw. To defeat her, we have to throw exploding baby dolls at her where she's also been doing the same to us. Once she's defeated, we gain access to a service elevator that almost immediately breaks. We have to replace the fuse, and when we head out to find one, she confronts us again. We have the final part of our battle with her in some good old-fashioned creepy melee doll bashing. We then get the satisfaction of putting this boss's head into a vise and smashing it. With that, Ethan makes it out of the doll factory and meets back up with Rosa. Rosa wants to head to the SCU office, but Ethan wants no part of it. She convinces him when she tells him that she may have found a connection between him and Van Horn. The reward for this level is a holster that allows us to store one ranged weapon on us. This is incredibly useful because after this point, we usually won't end up with just our fists as much. We'll actually have a backup just in case things go south. When we get to the office, Rosa shows Ethan the autopsy that she's done on Van Horn. His whole sternum was extracted after he was killed. Van Horn had some sort of deformity to the structure of his vocal cords. It also happens that Ethan's x-ray records had a redacted spot where his vocal cords were. Someone is clearly trying to cover up whatever vocal cord deformity these two have. Cutting out Van Horn's vocal cords proves that. Rosa wants to get new chest x-rays here, ones that aren't redacted. When we get inside the machine though, Rosa disappears and we head out into the halls in search of her. Ethan starts hallucinating, hearing things from radios and seeing stuff. He eventually comes across the head of security who is trapped. He helps us escape this place and we have almost an entire level where we use a gun. This level is actually one of my least favorites, following one with a really good set piece. First of all, the design isn't as unique as the last one. It mostly takes place in the SCU building, so we're just running through office halls. The other issue is that a lot of this level sees us shooting our opponents, and the thing just turns into a bland FPS for a moment. The absolute worst part of this level is an issue that Condemned 2 has quite a lot across its playtime. Because Ethan is hallucinating, there are a ton of visual glitches on screen and the camera is wobbling. This is so incredibly overdone though. There's just so much shit on screen that we can't even see half the time. It's terrible and just awful to play, to be honest. I could also imagine that if I was at all squeamish, I would probably be getting nauseous from this stuff. The last level had a similar issue with the gas mask. The thing just takes up way too much space on the screen and makes it so that we can't see anything. Now, I get that this is part of it. It's supposed to add to the intensity a little bit, taking away some of our vision, but it just goes over the top. And there are other games that have done this well without completely obscuring everything in front of us. Eventually, Ethan realizes this is all a hallucination that he was having while his x-ray was being done. When this is done, we have to head upstairs to talk to Director Farrell. He begins to grill us about the previous mission and almost seems to blame Ethan for what happened, rather than Dorland. This ends with Ethan attacking Farrell. Farrell defends himself, saying that he's getting his orders from higher up and his ultimate order is to keep Ethan safe. His assistant then calls in with Agent Dorland on the line. He says that the mayor has been killed in the recently opened museum downtown. 
With a bad level out of the way, we get the museum level, which is probably my favorite one in the entire game. When we arrive, we find the body of the mayor minus a head. She has a strange note on her labeled SKX and with familiar eyes from the first game. When we start investigating, we realize that the body was moved using a wheelbarrow. We have to track it inside, but there are guards everywhere. Since the investigation is being kept under wraps, they don't know we're here. Our optional objective for this level is to not kill any guards. This can be a little tough and was actually one of the only optional objectives that I failed throughout the whole game. As we're exploring the museum stealthily, Rosa calls us to let us know that the note might mean Serial Killer X is still alive. In this museum, we can actually sneak if we gently hold the left thumbstick up to walk, we'll make less noise and can get past guards. When we find the crime scene where the mayor was actually killed, we can look for some camera footage to show that someone had cut off the mayor's head and has taken it. It may well be Serial Killer X after all. At this point, we have to make our way over to the medieval tools exhibit, where the murder weapon was actually taken from. On our way there, people have begun to invade the museum. They're attacking the guards, stealing weapons, and even armor. This is where the level gets really great. We're still fighting low-life thieves and killers, but we're doing it in a medieval museum, wielding swords, axes, and fighting against armored foes. This whole thing is just so great and is a fantastic breath of fresh air in the middle of Condemned 2. We find a table with some metal instruments on it, and it seems like these instruments were taken from the mayor's body. Something truly strange is going on here. The final cherry on top of this level is actually the boss we fight at the end, the knight. This vagrant has decided to fully armor himself up so we can't even use melee weapons on him, but luckily we've ended up in a section of the museum exclusively made for crossbows. We have to shoot him in specific spots to do damage to him, and these have to be very precise. After some persistence though, the knight goes down and Ethan beheads him, in classic medieval fashion. Rosa and Dorland arrive at this point. Rosa found some specific deer dung on Van Horn's shoes. This type of deer only lives in the Black Lake region, and Rosa thinks this will lead them back to SKX. The only catch is Dorland is taking Ethan to his flight. On the plane, Ethan begins to see that mysterious man in the seat of the pilot, the man from the TV. He sows seeds of doubt in Ethan's mind about the director and the people he's working with. When the man disappears, the pilot has been killed and birds flood the plane as it crashes. When we get to the lake, we have to head to the lodge to see if we can find any trace of Leland Van Horn, aka SKX. But when we get to the lodge, SCU agents are already there and it looks like a massacre. If you've heard about Condemned 2 before, then you probably have at least heard about the bear. And there's good reason that so many people have talked about this part of the game, because it's one of the highlights. Earlier in the video, I said that Condemned 2 just doesn't have that same atmosphere or tension that the first game did. Well, I think this moment has that same tension. In this section, a bear chases us throughout the cabin. We're forced to run from it, crawl through cracks in the walls, and eventually explode some tanks beside it to defeat the thing. But the whole section just happens so fast, it's so visceral and so heavy. The sound design does a lot of work in this part. With the heavy footfalls of the bear behind us, we feel the tension and the pressure, the panic. This incredibly short section is just so well crafted. For a moment, we once again feel that true fear that the first game had in droves. Of course, it goes without saying that this whole thing is a bit ridiculous, and this is kind of the point in the game where we have to forget our binds on reality, because things are going to get really wacky here soon. The rest of this level is kind of a letdown, though, compared to the bear section. We find a door in the library in the cabin. This library could have vital information on SKX and Van Horn, so we need to get in there. But the door has already been rigged with a mechanism that will set off explosives around the cabin. We have to disconnect each of these bombs from the various areas and throw them out of nearby windows. It just feels very slow and disjointed, especially after such a high-paced scene. It feels like the progression has just come to a screeching halt. Not to mention the majority of this level's combat is fought with ranged weapons, so it's another shooting gallery mission, which is something I just didn't prefer in this entry. 
Once we get all the bombs deactivated, we gain access to the library and find a message for Ethan from Van Horn. This is the big moment for this game, the big twist. Here, every mystery from the first game is tied up and explained. Ethan's parents were originally a part of the Oro, this mystery group cult that we've been following. They defected when Ethan was young and they were killed for it. Van Horn was the only one that knew of Ethan. These days, the Oro is a much larger and more powerful force. They know about Ethan, and they think that Ethan will be a force to reckon with. SKX has now joined with the Oro, but Van Horn isn't too happy about this. They were responsible for the death of Van Horn's family. During this message, SCU agents blast into the room, and we have to fight them off until LaRue saves the day with a massive snowmobile. Rosa's lab is being swarmed by Dorland's men, and Farrell has gone missing. At the same time, the city has continued to fall apart. Nothing has gotten better. The commissioner has showed up to the SCU, though, because SKX is alive, and they've found him. We now have to track him down and get information out of him. When we reach him, he's being held in a bus. Leland killed Van Horn because he wouldn't cooperate, because he possessed the Oro secret. He's become completely indoctrinated into the cult at this point. The bus then crashes into the bowling alley where we have to push our way through crowds of goons. We find a list of the to be killed from SKX, the last on the list in Magic Man, somebody we haven't heard of yet. There's a truly horrifying sequence here where we find a ton of torture devices littering a locker room. People are being kept in cages in terrible conditions. We eventually end up back in the school from the first game. You notice this by the familiar environments, but also because the butcher we fought is still here. It could be a different one, but it looks a lot like it. We find Farrell strapped to a table and we have to cut him loose and guide him out. We then fall into a bum fight cage where we have to fend for Ethan's life. At this point, we realize that Dorland and Farrell are both a part of the Oro, but Farrell has actually been looking out for Ethan. Farrell gives his life for us to develop our new power. He tells Ethan to find the voice, and Ethan screams, blowing up Farrell's head. Ethan is swarmed by agents and makes his escape. He runs into SKX, but he lets Ethan go. Ethan then realizes who the Magic Man is, a magician that hangs out at Svensson's Magic Theater. At this point, the Mystery Man is back, who we can just call what it is, Ethan's demon. He's begging Ethan to give in, to take a drink, but Ethan stands up against this. He takes back control and beats this demon down. This is one of my least favorite levels that we're about to start. It's very short and feels super out of place. There's a big fiery ring in the center of this theater that we have to stop from spinning. Once we get inside, the magic man has been torturing somebody with tricks. Rosa also tells us throughout this level that the voice that the aura was talking about and the ability that Ethan pulled off on Farrell is something in his vocal cords. They can create a sound like no one else, and the Oro have created people to do this with implants, the pieces of metal attached to the jaws of the soldiers. At the end of this level, we have a fight with the Magic Man where he teleports to different spots around the stage. All we have to do is toss bottles of alcohol at him until he teleports onto the spike platform and catch him in the death trap. Before he dies, he tells Ethan that his voice is a gift. He was given this gift from birth, and it's what the Oro fears. He tells Ethan to head to the peninsula and it disappears. At the end of this level, our shakiness with guns will now be gone, since Ethan has beaten his demons and resisted that deadly urge. Rosa and Ethan decide to get to the bottom of all of this and head there now. On a boat, they're attacked by birds, and Ethan's gift awakens again, scaring Rosa off. She's trapped in the trash barge, and we have to chase her. At this point, we begin crawling through a trash barge and eventually are attacked by a massive robot. Yeah, that's what I meant when I said off the rails. I don't really know how to feel about this level because it's just kind of jarring. We went from beating down thieves and junkies and abandoned buildings to fighting giant trash robots. It's wild. Anyways, we have to defeat the hunk of metal by crawling into a bus, hanging from a vehicle magnet, and shoot it with an explosive crossbow. We head deeper into the barge to find Rosa running away from three of the metal monsters and locking herself behind a door. We destroy them by picking them up with magnets and tossing them into a trash compactor. When we find Rosa, she apologizes for running off. Ethan hears a sound off in the distance and heads to investigate. He's quickly knocked out and overwhelmed, forced to defend himself with a nail gun. 
Rosa finds him and tries to get him to stay down, but he won't, even with a bolt hole in his leg. He crawls into a nearby shipping container and meets his demon once again. This man represents all of Ethan's demons. He has to accept his fate, his gift. Ethan's hallucinations have been coming from the Oro, most likely worsened by the alcohol, but the group was their true origin. The demon forces Ethan to accept his gift, and at the final stage of the game, we can now use the voice attack. We trigger this by pressing the left and right bumpers back and forth. It takes a little bit of time to recharge, but this attack will explode enemies' heads, just like we did with Feral. It's pretty useful and will actually become a mandatory mechanic at the end of this level. It's worth noting as well that in this level, we can tune into the radio stations to find out that Tony Rhodes, the local reporter who was investigating the streets, was killed by the very mob he was looking into. We're forced to run through multiple areas of this huge fortress, being attacked by SCU agents, strange creatures, and eventually the Oro's own watchdogs. The ceiling enemies have jaw attachments that allow them to use the voice, and so do the ones walking around. We can only stun them by first using the voice on them, and then we can beat them down. Once we reach the end of this level, we can finally confront Dorland. The big brother machine that he's started is influencing the entire city, and means to control them all. Ethan destroys this machine and then takes down Dorland himself. With his dying breath, he says that the Oro's goals are to sow discord into the population, and make the Oro the protectors of the world. Ethan has to escape before the machine explodes, and Dorland tries one last move to take care of Ethan, but falls to his death. Ethan is then lifted out of there, and Rosa tells him that they're finding out more and more about the Oro. Apparently some incredibly influential people belong to the organization, and big things are coming. We then see a scene of the president being handed a note before he has an apparent heart attack. The note states that the remedy is among us, revealing that the president himself may be a part of the organization, or was, at least. The final scene of the game shows SKX assumingly becoming the new head of the Oro, or at least a high ruling member, setting up a return for the villain in the next entry. Condemned 2's story is incredibly wild. You can tell that the team definitely leaned into the whole paranormal thing this time around. In my video on the first game, I said that those parts were my least favorite, but here it really works. I think the team genuinely wanted to do something different, and instead of slowly introducing small mechanics and plot beats, they just went full bore. The story definitely doesn't work on various different levels. There are things seriously wrong with it, and entire chapters that just feel out of place, but it's one of those guilty pleasure things that you almost just have to enjoy. It's so fun, and you can tell that the team was having fun with it as well. It doesn't take itself incredibly seriously, and it usually just fares on the side of whatever would be coolest in any given situation. Before I talk about my final thoughts on Condemned 2, I'd like to pass it off to my friend Evan Prince, a veritable expert on the Condemned series. Thanks for having me on for this one. I really appreciate this opportunity because I have quite a lot to say about these games, and this one in particular. They were pretty special to me back in the 360 days, and I remember playing through them multiple times. I was kind of obsessed. Some of the more old school fans might remember that iconic creepypasta going around for a while about the cursed Condemned 3 disc that got leaked to the public. Condemned 3 Rise of the Oro. If you've heard that, then it's because you were like me, constantly searching for new info about a potential sequel. Well, a sequel indeed was supposed to happen, but it was canned for the team to focus on other endeavors before it could even enter concept phases, which led to this IP going cold for a while before a glimmer of hope shined in 2015 when Jace Hall, who owns the IP rights to Condemned, granted them to an indie studio to make a follow-up title with no restrictions, a process that, unfortunately, never went anywhere. I should note that while this was happening, I was actually in contact with Jace Hall back in 2015 regarding my involvement in adapting Condemned to a novelization format. I shared some of my written work and he was impressed and was totally on board with the idea. I even have the emails to prove it, here's the receipts. This was back when I aspired to be a novel writer. However, after some back and forth, Jace informed me that he had granted the rights to a studio, given them my pitch and information, and said he would leave it up to them to contact me if they wanted to work with me on my pitch in any way regarding how they wanted to pursue developing the game. They never did, and they never got their project off the ground either. Seven years later, and we're still in the same place we were regarding the Condemned franchise. 
The reason I'm saying that is to first off say, Jace Hall is an awesome guy. And second, I legit do love the Condemned games. I hope this story has given me some small manner of clout with you on that notion, viewers, because what I'm about to say may very well damage it if you're a fan of the series. I like Condemned 2 more than Condemned 1. I know, I know, this is normally when I'm bombarded with reasons why I'm wrong and told I don't get it and I'm not actually a fan or something. I can promise you I've heard it before. The common consensus across the board is that Condemned Criminal Origins is a hidden masterpiece while its sequel was some kind of regretful trash. Seriously man, I love both games, but I have seen people use the first game to just rag on its sequel, which feels unfair to me when Condemned 2 Bloodshot offers so many things the first one doesn't. That said, I adore Criminal Origins, I don't have anything bad to say about it but I do have a lot of praise I want to give to Bloodshot that I feel no one ever does. First off, this is the only game I've ever found like it. It's seriously one of a kind, and I know because playing it created a need that I've been unable to fill with anything else ever since. Let me tell you in short what I love about Bloodshot. I love that I can play this game set in an overly edgy, dark city filled with drug addicts who I can beat the hell out of with my fists and straight up brutally execute with unique environmental animations. I've been trying to find a game even similar to this. The melee combat is so hyper specific and brutally satisfying. It's gory. It's gross. The enemies you're facing are genuinely disturbing, not because they're some kind of horror monsters either. The time we face those is when the game is at its weakest. It's because they're real people, homeless drug addicts and criminals being driven insane and into violence. And let's talk about the atmosphere. It's also unique. Sure, it's a dark, edgy game with a gross city. You'd think that wouldn't be very hard to find, but this is different. Yes, there are times when the game just straight up stops taking itself seriously, I'm not denying that. In the first hour, you're seeing a decapitated woman in a garage and trying to solve a murder. Shortly after that, you're throwing exploding baby dolls at drug addicts. Then you're fighting a woman in a clown outfit. Then you're killing dudes with medieval replica weapons in a museum. Then you're fighting a magician. Then you're getting chased by a bear. Then you have Marvel superhero powers that let you yell really loud and kill people. Yes. It's ridiculous, and that's not something I'm defending. But again, coming back to that initial gameplay and atmosphere, I cannot feel the need that this game gave me. I want an entire game of just Condemned 2's first few levels. The edgy protagonist, the brutal hand-to-hand -hand melee, the nasty, grimy aesthetic. And I know I might catch hell for this, but I'd love it if we got like a small open world sort of deal where we collect birds and tune into TV and radio stations like we already do in this game wandering the streets of a city, progressively becoming more and more violent due to the influence of the Oro. This game has some really stupid moments and some really stupid writing, but I've played through it like so many times trying to tap into that atmosphere and grimy hand-to-hand -hand gameplay again. The fact that it's trying too hard to be edgy is not something you can find anymore either. Everyone's trying too hard to be ironic and self-aware now. There are other games that get close to scratching that itch, like Escape from Butcher Bay, yet even then the melee combat in that is half as satisfying for me to play. People tend to focus on all of the things Bloodshot got wrong when talking about it because Criminal Origins got so much right. Like I said, I love that one too, but for as much as Bloodshot got wrong, it got a lot right too. I've been defending this title as a must play for years. And to this day, I've not been able to find a game that gets close to replicating my favorite things from this game. The enemies are stupidly over the top, the environments are cartoonish a lot of times, and the superpowers come out of nowhere and kind of make the game worse. But the investigation is interesting, the collecting and atmosphere is disgusting and immersive, and the combat is brutal, fun, and compelling. Every encounter you find is something that I just really love. Melee weapons range from bats to toilet seats. It's really the most in the gutter horror game I've seen since maybe Manhunt. Admittedly, there is not a big demographic for this kind of game, and I'm not saying it's better than the first game. In so many ways, it's not, and unfortunately, its mistakes pretty much killed the franchise. What I am saying is that there is a massive amount of game to love here that you won't find anywhere else if you go into it knowing what to expect. 
So the fact that it's locked to physical consoles as the only real way to play it is honestly kind of heartbreaking. I want to encourage people to try this game, but I mean, come on. It's probably not worth the amount of effort it would take unless you've already got a console laying around your house. Maybe they'll polish up the ROM issues and emulation will become a legitimate method of experiencing the game. Maybe Jace Hall will get inspired to try to license the IP to a studio like Night Dive to totally remaster both games and release them across modern platforms, including PC. That doesn't seem likely right now, but I can hope all the same. Because Bloodshot really deserves to be available to PC audiences just like its predecessor is. In the meantime, I hope that maybe both games can steadily continue to find their cult followings who will be ready to show up if interest in an official revisiting of these titles starts to happen again. Which is all I really want to see. Another entry or continuation into the Condemned world just feels like a bad idea too far away from the originals to even try. So I'm just holding out hope for a half decent remaster port to PC. Again, thanks so much to your favorite son for having me. I really love this game, and I'm glad I got to say some things on it. Condemned 2 Bloodshot is a game I'm kind of torn on. On one hand, the game is pretty rough. Some controls and interactions are janky. The level design can be annoying and frustrating at points. The visual effects for the hallucinations make certain stages god-awful to look at. The aiming for ranged weapons feels clunky, and the increase in shooting missions is just a full-on negative for me. Not to mention the fact that the story is wild and a complete far cry from what came before it. The second half of the game forces the player to suspend all belief because we almost can't even understand what's happening. It's one of those games that if I didn't research it before playing, I would have thought it was made by a different developer. But on the other hand, Condemned 2 is irrevocably its own. It's a unique and interesting project that pretty much encapsulates the late 2000s. It has that perfect aesthetic and almost exists as a time capsule, but that doesn't stop it from still working today. The game's combat is outstandingly fun. Every single area that the team could have improved upon, they did. There were areas that I didn't even think could get better from the first game, and somehow they pulled it off. It just feels fun to play, and it's one of those rare short single-player games that you could beat all over again just to mess around with the fighting systems. They even include an FPS mode once you beat the game so that you can run back through and just use guns with an unlimited supply of ammo. The story, though, probably objectively poorly written, is just kind of great in a really fun way. Thinking back to all the big plot beats, sure it feels goofy and out of nowhere, but I can't say that the ending doesn't feel satisfying, that I didn't want to play along with the weird aesthetic that they were going for, that I didn't love what was happening. And this all comes down to motive. If I felt that the studio was cashing in on some trend or that they were trying to make a quick buck, then I wouldn't be saying this, but it all feels real. This kind of aesthetic, writing, and style can only work if the intentions are genuine. If they're fake, then the audience will feel it, and it doesn't feel fake at all here. The game is definitely a story of two hands, but I think in the end, I arrive at the hand that thinks this game is awesome. It's trying to be cool, and it is fucking cool. Condemned 2 was given decent reviews upon release. It currently sits at an 82 for the PS3 version of the game. Most journalists cited the combat design and the atmosphere as their favorite parts of the project, and a lot of them criticized the story as the weakest section. Condemned 2 Bloodshot ended up doing pretty terrible in sales, whether it be due to marketing, fans not enjoying the changes, or the game just not catching on, I can't be totally sure, but the sales definitely weren't enough for Sega to greenlight another entry in the series. Jace Hall, the founder of Monolith Productions, now owns the sole rights to the property. He has said in the past that he would like to give Condemned to an indie studio that could do something with it, but these comments are from as far back as 2015 and nothing has really manifested since then. This is honestly one of those games that definitely needs a remaster. I don't often call for this because usually the games I talk about are good enough on their own that nothing really needs to change, but bringing this game to modern systems is a must. At the very least, a PC port should be made so that mass audiences can have access to it. It's just way too good to be sitting there, trapped on the PS3 and the Xbox 360, where no one can really play it.
I'm not sure what the future of the Condemned series will be, but I know that if these studios decide to resurrect this old, dirty, and forgotten behemoth, then I'll be there. Bye, Dad.